Okay. Uh, what I would like to do in my instructions from Cindy Kelly were that we were to try to sort of give you ideas that you could incorporate in various lesson plans. And so I'll try to do that along the way. And I'll speak for, well, maybe 45 minutes and then have 10 minutes of Q&A afterwards. And as, as John said, this is incorporating what I have already done and a book manuscript that I just mailed off to our middle daughter who does all my typing because she's the only one who can read my handwriting. <laughs> I still write by hand. It's the only way I know how to do it. And the third one is called Atomic Comics, how cartoonists have dealt with the theme of the atomic bomb. And here's an idea that your students might be able to realize. Uh, take the cartoons and analyze their opinions on atomic power, um, uh, atomic medicine, or what have you. Uh, now, here's a face I'm sure you all know. Uh, if you may remember that when we entered the 21st century, Time magazine had a contest for who would be the person of the century. And I lost a dollar on that. I thought it would be Franklin Roosevelt, but uh, I lost. Do you know who it was? Einstein. It was Einstein. Uh, and in retrospect, that's clearly correct. Einstein was the, per the person of the century. And the creation of the atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project, was unanimous as the event of the 20th century, and it probably ranks among the five most significant events in the entire history of the world. And you know, here's one for the students. Can you come up with any invention that is comparable to the creation of the atomic bomb? Now, Einstein it was, of course, becomes the symbol of genius for America, and right after the end of World War I, he comes over to the United States and causes an Einstein craze. America went Einstein mad in 1920 and 21. <clears throat> and uh, the New York Public Library took out all of his books and put them on a huge table, and the table was crowded from the time it opened till the time it closed. He gave a number of lectures, and while his English was good, it wasn't perfect. So most of the lectures were in German, but people who did not understand German came to hear him. <clears throat> he met the president. <clears throat> he met Warren Harding, and which produced the headline, Einstein Idea Puzzles Harding. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and he became acknowledged as a wizard, uh, a, a genial, friendly wizard. <clears throat> Everyone was confident that this wizard surely would mean no harm. Now, it just so happened that in the 1920s, when Einstein arrived, there was the creation of a new subfield called science writing. The sports writing emerged in the 1920s, and so the sports page becomes very important for newspapers. The fashion page is very important in the 1920s. And then there's a third, less well-known genre, science writing. And the science writers tried to explain Einstein to the average American citizen, and it was not an easy task. <clears throat> One Yale professor said, the average person is never going to get it. Astronomers and physicists must fight it out, and the rest of us will have to wait. Uh, another book came out in the 1920s and said, everybody knows that Einstein did something, but nobody's quite sure what he, what he did. <laughs> Well, this is my theory, and if you see any holes in it, please let me know, because this is the manuscript being typed. I think that the average American learned about subatomic physics and this incredible world that was evolving through Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon, who were popular newspaper comic strips. This is Buck Rogers and the Depth Men of Jupiter, and there's his 25-year girlfriend, Wilma Deering. <clears throat> Buck Rogers is the first science uh, comic, newspaper comic strip adventure. Now, today's newspapers <clears throat> cannot rely on people who read them every day. So we no longer have adventure comic strips in the papers. 
all the comic strips are jokes because you can't assume that people are going to read it Monday through Sunday. You could at this time. And so there were serial adventures. And Buck Rogers' adventures are still pretty exciting. <clears throat> he, uh, fall, he is a veteran of World War I. He is a radiation mine inspector. <clears throat> he falls asleep. He wakes 500 years later, and he's in the 25th century. That was his girlfriend. He has a scientific uh, advisor, and he fights dastardly villains. <clears throat> Buck Rogers was so successful that the serial companies put him on radio, he was in the movies, and then kids could not only read about the adventures of Buck Rogers in the 25th century, they could also buy a Buck Rogers atomic pistol, which let off a series of sparks, and the Buck Rogers disintegrator gun, which was a squirt gun, so you could participate in the 25th century. <laughs> you, uh, and it was so successful that, a, that an imitator came, and this, of course, was Flash Gordon. This is the end of Ming. <clears throat> and Fla it was, Flash Gordon was stolen exactly from Buck Rogers. There was the hero. <clears throat> there was the love interest. And then there was the dastardly villain. And I, I'm sure most of you do not remember Buck Rogers' dastardly villain, who was Killer Kane with his female sidekick, Ardella. But you probably do know Flash Gordon's dastardly villain. Who, who was he? He's, the name's gone into the language. He's the worst villain between Simon Legree and Darth Vader. <clears throat> Ming the Merciless, precisely. <laughs> Ming the Merciless, there he is. <clears throat> okay, and Mickey Mouse began explaining the subatomic world uh, in the newspapers to the ordinary citizen. <clears throat> and this is my theory. <clears throat> the, the average person instantly recognized, when Harry Truman announced that Hiroshima and had occurred, instantly recognized what had happened. <clears throat> and my theory is the reason the average person in America did so recognize was because they had been schooled in Buck Rogers in the 25th century and Flash Gordon. Now, all of these Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, science fiction types got their science all wrong. <clears throat> Buck had a disintegrator ray. H.G. Wells wrote about uh, atomic bombs made out of lumps of pure car carolinium. Another science fiction writer said an atomic bomb consisted of a can of cadmium alloy with a speck of radium in a beryllium holder. The atomic beam that Superman had to diffuse uh, vibrated buildings to death. So their science was all wrong, but that's not the point. Uh, the point is that the popular culture got the principle. The principle was that there was an element. If it could be split, it would release an enormous amount of power. There would be dangerous rays that would come from it. Uh, that if this were to fall in the hands of a dastardly enemy, uh, all hell would break loose. So that, they got that exactly right. And that's the, my theory. That's how the average American citizen viewed the uh, atomic bomb when it was announced. The co-pilot of the Enola Gay, the plane that dropped the atomic bomb, uh, whose name is Robert Lewis, put it this way, quoting, we were struck dumb at the sight. It far exceeded all our expectations. Even though we expected something terrific, the actual sight caused us all to feel that we were Buck Rogers, 21st, uh, 25th century warriors. And the same is true for Flash Gordon. Uh, the, you saw the film last night, Fat Man and Little Boy. It's really a remake of the very first atomic film, the beginning of the end, or, or the end, 19. 46, uh, the dialogue in the beginning and the end goes like this. You know, Hi, my name's Matt Cochran. Hi yourself, I'm Je Jeff Nixon. Give me a fill-in on all this Flash Gordon business. Matt grinned. Compared to what we're trying to do, Flash Gordon is a kid from the Stone Age. <laughs>